Medicine's still a very important thing and you guys work hard very every day. So we're just gonna have a good half hour here and chat about some stuff. Now, everybody is a wound care expert that's in the room, correct? So, you know, I, um, here, let me just get past the disclosure side. So I'm obviously, I'm receiving an honorarium, but I'm gonna talk about a lot of things in my personal opinion. And one of the things is engage in a dialogue because there's a lot of things you guys do that's really great. There's a lot of things a guy like me as a medical director of our wound clinic can learn from. And one of, one of my niche areas where I'm really, really working hard on educating our patients, educating our nurses, educating colleagues is the, is the importance of the microcirculation. And if we don't have good microcirculation, we can't get good angiogenesis. It's tough to get good wound bed prep. So this, this principle of interstitial reduction is really significant. And then interstitial reduction plays into the five micron microvasculature improvement, which enhances this whole other topic, the thing called the glycocalyx, which is a, an hour long talk in itself. But if we don't reduce interstitial edema and so much interstitial edema is not taken care of because it's not, it's just not identified. I, I was with a guy today, here he is, he's uh, 68. And he looks at me and says, for 30 years, I've had swelling in my legs. And he's, he's a little big, his BMI is you know, sitting around 40, but it's not like it's 60, but 30 years he's been dealing with swelling. He's been going to his primary care doc. Nobody was doing anything other than the typical, we're gonna put you on a diuretic. We're gonna get you into compression socks. Nobody was addressing the why. So then it comes to in uh, uh, May, he gets a right total knee arthroplasty. And he develops cellulitis. He's had so many episodes of cellulitis over the last 30 years, gets an episode of cellulitis. Uh, he has to go back and get the hardware taken out, get a spacer, get the beads put in. Uh, he falls on this, splits open the wound. And you know, it's just this whole myriad of things. And I was looking at him and what I wanted to say was, you know, we failed you as a medical community. And here's how we failed you. Number one, in medical school, we don't get taught about lymphedema, which you clearly have because he's got a stem or toe, buffalo hump, the whole nine yards for lymphedema. And so we're not getting taught this in medical school. So naive guys like me come out and I miss it most of my career, just like I've missed some of the basic elements of wound healing. And then, uh, uh, and then we go forward and we're still, he still hasn't seen a PMNR doc. He still hasn't seen a cert certified lymphedema therapist and he still isn't getting good basic uh, lymphedema cares. So you can't, get good wound bed prep unless you get the lymphedema taken care of because you got to get rid of the interstitial edema to maximize the microcirculatory flow. And this then is what goes into, you know, as we're sitting here looking at this 23% chance of lower extremity amputation, um, all these complexes with the, the readmission rates. And I'm convinced if we could better manage uh, uh, interstitial edema and manage lymphedema, uh, we would decrease a lot of this stuff. And, uh, and even in the Wagner groups, you know, we think of the DFUs, it's now very clear in peer reviewed literature that almost every diabetic foot has associated lymphatic dysfunction that leads to interstitial edema that, that prevents primary healing also increases recidivism rates. So if, if we're, we gotta start treating all our diabetic patients as if they have lymphedema and how do we get that lymphatic component taken care of? Um, and of course, the five-year mortality, when you look at it, having a neuropathic ulcer um, and getting an amputation puts you up there with having colon cancer, Hodgkin's disease in terms of five-year mortality. Because systemically, your body's failing if you got to the point where you've had an amputation. And again, neuropathic ulceration speaks to relatively diabetes. So wound bed prep is absolutely one of the most critical principles that, that we can discuss because I don't think it matters what you stick on the wound if you don't have good angiogenesis to support um, revascularization um, of whatever you put on the wound. So it's probably one of our biggest failures in the United States. Again, a, a group like you guys, uh, knowing these principles then maximizes outcomes for the patients and also maximizes the economic um, implications. Because if we're just thoughtlessly tossing a Hail Mary pass of something onto a wound bed that's not prepped, it, it, we all know that we're wasting a lot of that product. That is not what we want to do. 
one of the um, uh, principles then in wound bed prep is it, it's debridement and then it's stimulation. And um, how do you stimulate? Well, you stimulate from outward in, but also inward out. So we're also big on micronutrients. Some of the big micronutrients that have been shown beyond a shadow of a doubt now to impact endothelial cell health, which is then the microvasculature, is vitamin D is huge for uh, um, for endothelial cell health. Carolyn Fife's blog, which I read regularly, she had a blog maybe 18, 20 months ago that talked about vitamin D dosing her patients, literally five to ten thousand dollars or five to ten thousand units a day, vitamin D. Where people up here in Minnesota, you know, there are, we have a huge percent of people that are vitamin D deficient. So uh, we're tossing everybody on vitamin D supplements right away, five, between five and 10,000. I don't even check levels because you're not gonna get, it's so rare to get toxic. And we do that until the wounds are healed. B12, uh, milligram a day, folate or folic acid a milligram a day, especially for those patients that are MTHFR deficient. So if they have high homocysteine levels, it's not an issue about uh, microthrombi, it's the fact that their machinery, the gears within the endothelial cell can't function if you have an MTHFR deficiency. So we'll actually draw, that's the one genetic test I do pretty regularly. Um, it's been shown in peer reviewed literature that at least 30% of people that have a VLU, especially the ones that are chronic and non-healing or high recidivism rate, they're MTHFR deficient. So once we start hitting all those people hard with B12 and folate, uh, and there's actually a prescription medication called Roommate, uh, same company that makes vascular or uh, micronized purified flavonoid fraction. That also really facilitated our healing rates and decreased our recidivism rates. And then uh, L-arginine, because of course that's turned into nitric oxide when you get recoupling of nitric oxide synthetase. So L-arginine could be in the form of juve and it could be just L-arginine that you can get on Amazon. Um, and then we add in uh, vitamin C as well, just for uh, as obviously sailors that didn't get vitamin C all got scurvy and so just to help. So that, that machinery of the inside out is absolutely critical to wound bed prep. So obviously perfusion's huge, checking ABIs, checking TBIs. If you've got near infrared uh, spectroscopy, uh, Adam Landsman just published a great report on that in wounds here a couple months ago. Um, making sure there's adequate perfusion, obviously getting rid of non-viable tissue because that is what's gonna harbor uh, increased colony forming units, which then decreases your, your take rate. Um, picking up a course on erysipelas, cellulitis. Um, and then here's that point about resolve edema. So you can't resolve edema unless you identify edema. So one of the things I always do is I take my finger and I put it on the tibia while I'm talking to the patient and I'm looking for that pitting. I'm squeezing the second toe. I'm looking for the stem or sign. I'm looking at the buffalo hump. Kind of those classic signs that is either interstitial edema or maybe it's lymphedema. And the more you talk to people and then you have to differentiate it from lipedema, which is painful fat syndrome. So one of the biggest offending drugs that out there that causes edema is Norvasc or amlodipine. So ask your patients about that because if they're on that, 50% of patients are getting enhanced interstitial edema just because of that drug alone. So get them off Nor Norvasc or amlodipine. We got to obviously be good historians, good clinicians, finding out is there repetitive pressure and repetitive trauma that's, that's causing and contributing to the wound, especially in those mirror wounds where it might be on the outside of the left ankle, inside of the right ankle, it's a pressure wound. We had a uh, gal clinic just today who came in with six different wounds. So left IT, um, she's always laying on her left side. So, and then it was the inside of her right ankle, outside of her left ankle. You know, it's just these mirror images that you, you gotta look at those patterns to then figure out what am I gonna do? Because obviously not only is her body not doing well, but I gotta get her onto a group two mattress. I gotta make sure I got pressure relief, all those things. Um, and then wound bed moisture balance is critical. Now, the other point I would add in about moist to moist and the point we talk about is wet to dry. When I hear colleagues say that, my first response is wet to dry is a great way to make beef jerky. But in wound healing, we're not about making beef jerky. We're trying to get the wound to heal. So moist to moist um, and add in hypochlorous acid. Are you guys using hypochlorous acid, whether it's Vosh, whether it's Pearson, whether it's et cetera in your wound clinic yet? They said it's yes. A whole, yes, because it's obviously a whole nother discussion about hypochlorous versus hypochlorite. So we want to decrease wound pH to a 5.5. That's what accelerates wound bed healing. Um, pain is the fifth factor that we talk about for vital signs, optimization of host factors like we talked about with micronutrients. And this is what then gets us on the healing trajectory. So when it comes to wound bed prep, 
as a surgeon, and I know there's, there's, I think there's a couple surgeons in the audience. When I look at a wound like this, we have the luxury to be able to take these patients to the operating room and really do a good debridement. When I see tendon like that, I'm worried about how far proximal and how far distal did that truly go. And, um, and the biggest message I want you to think about with Sonic 1 is it's not the end all, but it is a phenomenal device for accelerating wound. So you, you can't look at a wound like this and say Sonic 1 is going to take everything. You still need a 10 blade. And sharp debridement with a 10 blade or a curette or a similar device is critical. That also is going to make Sonic 1 that much more functional in terms of accelerating wound um, healing. So we're going to go a little bit more into the piezoelectric effect and why Sonic 1 actually works. But we're always trying to go back and restart that inflammatory cascade because when things are stuck in chronic, the, the late stage chronic inflammation, it's not going to then advance to proliferation, angiogenesis, epithelialization and wound closure. So biofilms are obviously huge. This is again where hypochlorous acid comes in. This is where sharp debridement comes in. This is where sonic one comes in because biofilms are actually incredibly thick. They're not just on the surface. They can be 500 to 600 microns thick. So if you're not impacting the depth of the microbiome, the, the depth of the biofilm, you can walk out of the operating room two days later, you're right back to square one. So one of the things that I think from a theoretical standpoint is going on with, um, with Sonic 1 is because of the piezoelectric effect. So piezoelectric uh, components are obviously in ultrasound as well. That's operating in the megahertz. In this device, it's in the kilohertz, so 22.5 kilohertz. And it's that transfer of energy that then penetrates tissues causing micro deformation, as well as creating these, this turbulence because we're using, I typically will use uh, Prontosan in mine because I like that the PHMB uh, component with the detergent. So that, that it, this expanding bubble until it burst will penetrate deep. So it's getting farther down than we can get with a knife to impact the thickness of the biofilm and ultimately have an impact on uh, bactericidal, bacteriostatic impact. And that's, I think, where the benefit comes where you're not getting that biofilm back as quick. So again, at 22.5 kilohertz, this is something that protects tissues yet can get rid of biofilms. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a couple different types of heads we're going to talk about. Again, just to point out, sharps are an absolute. You've got to have sharps. This is never going to alleviate um, or eliminate sharp utilization in the operating room. Or if you have the good fortune to have Sonic 1 in the clinic, which I would love to have. That's my next, uh, my next what I'd love to be able to do then um, you're still going to do the sharp debridement, but then you're going to use this to do the fine tuning, do the stimulation that lasts long after you're done doing the debridement. And this is how we then um, stimulate the wound going forward and achieve uh, faster results. So, uh, and they've done studies to look at this cavitation effect and the impact on the, the bacteria within the biofilm. So again, we're trying to eliminate colony forming units, anything above 10 to the fifth is considered critical. And that's where things tip more into easily development of erysipelas cellulitis. So by decreasing bacterial load, um, th this helps significantly. So obviously we're talking about with target procedures, it's all comers. I've used Sonic 1 from head to toe. And um, I think you have to obviously be, be careful when you're around an epithelial or, or around uh, say mouth, eyeballs, um, any type of, um, uh, epithelial tract. But when it comes to bone, it's phenomenal. When it comes to any soft tissues, it's, it's really good. It's great inside tunnels, as I'll show you um, in, a, in a video clip I have from one of my cases. So it, but it applies to all types of ulcerations and all types of wounds throughout the entire body. So there's really not a significant limitation. We talked about the five log uh, reduction. We talked about improving um, uh, less blood loss. It, when combined with sharp debridement. I'm going to take a little issue with this issue about cost. So it's going to reduce time to healing. The time in the operating room ends up being about the same. The same. Because we're so siloed in healthcare, the OR is one silo, the outpatient's one silo, the hospital's one silo. If you take cost to healing and average it across all those helos or silos, cost has decreased. If you look at the OR itself, because you're bringing in the machine, you're bringing in the the, um, the devices, you're, pro you're going to see a little spike in the operating room itself. We've got to look longitudinally and horizontally at cost. 
And so um, when you pursue use of this in the clinic, pursue use in the um, operating room, you got to make sure and look at the cost throughout the spectrum of wound care. Um, and obviously I've, I've seen it for, I, I do a lot of split thickness skin grafting. For my split, thin, uh, split thickness skin grafts, this has been a phenomenal adjunct. So you've got the debridement probes, you've got the bone cutting probes. I don't use the bone cutting probes. My two favorite are the curette. There's a smaller size and there's a larger size. And then there's the uh, hatchet. And the hatchet's great for uh, really doing good, uh, good debridement. The curette, um, the large curette really makes it much more efficient. So I've got a case coming up that's um, dermatomyosis. We're okay, Katie? Oh, hatchets. Yeah. You know, so I was driving through Madison, Wisconsin, and there's a there's one of those hatchet bars where you can go in and throw hatchets against the wall. Yeah. It's like it's like that's crazy. Yeah, I think I'd up my life insurance before I went in there. So the large hatchets, I, we, we've got a guy coming up who's got a circumferential dermatomyositis with uh, uh, calcinosis. We're taking off all the skin, all this cast-like calcium, and, is, and this is going to be about a 1,200 centimeter squared uh, wound when we're all done. That's where we're going to use this large cure at. It'll be a really nice time saver. So when you look at skin options, and I, I'm going to, we all would be in the same boat or the same choir saying, Human skin autograft is the best to use um, for cases as able. For those people where maybe they're elderly, they don't have a good harvest um, ability, um, then we got to start looking at what are the best options. And this is where, again, proven again and again, and over the course of time, over 100 years, human skin allograft is still one of the best options for treating. So TheraSkin is, you'll see it called a bioactive, so a BSA, a bioactive um, human substrate. You'll see it called a cryopreserved um, substrate, but ultimately it's harvested, it's cryopreserved. So the living cell has been proven that when you do the two saline rinse, and when you look on the backside and you examine those, they are there are still cells that are viable, still cells that can contribute to reconstruction of the architecture of the wound to get that extracellular matrix reconstructed and then to have the growth factor option to comp complete the milieu of the local environment to uh, complete closure. So when you look at the accreditation body, and I think this is really important. So accreditation for the TheraSkin that we use comes from the American Association of Tissue Banks. So this is a long honored institution that has been in charge of this component of uh, gaining organs. So if you look at 100 people that are potentially uh, viable donors, only two are accepted. So of course they've been screened for HIV, they've been screened for Hep B, Hep C. Um, and so when we get that skin, we can be very confident that we're getting um, a, a piece of skin that's gonna be, have passed all the marks so that we have a zero rate of disease transmission. That's our goal. That's what I would do for my, any one of my family members. And that's what we're gonna do for our patients. And then of course, consistency in the quality of the piece of skin we're getting, because you don't want one piece that's like super thin and one piece that's thick. And every time you open it up, you're gonna be confident in the consistency of what we're getting. So if we look at the timeline of skin substitute uh, market. It, it's interesting because I feel like we've kind of come full circle. Back in the late 1800s, human skin allograft, obviously not cryopreserved, not, didn't go through all the uh, disease uh, ev evaluations that we now have the benefit of having, but that was the first original um, option. And then we got into platelet-rich uh, plasma, which uh, one of the centers for excellence of that early on was uh, Knight in, oh, at the University of Minnesota where I'm working now. And then uh, Regranix comes in as a single, uh, a single source um, uh, way to manage DFUs. And then we start getting into kind of those combos, right, where you got uh, human foreskin infused with type 2 bovine collagen, and you've got other types of acellular or cellularized types of um, uh, options. And then we get into the, the emergence of Theraskin in 2009, which really had to be validated, procured. And the reason it took a little while to get back around to human allograft was we went through the HIV epidemic, we went through the hep C stuff, and you have to have confidence and security in making sure that these are really, really good products. Now, amniotics, interesting. If you look at amniotics were not introduced into medicine in 2013, they were being used in the 
40s for uh, ocular surgery, they've made their uh, way into the chronic wound care market. So that was more of the introduction in 2013. I think we have to always look at where is this product coming from and think about teleologically, what was that tissue doing in its original uh, uh, component? So we have to think about this from an environmental standpoint. Those cells lived in a certain environment and they had to respond to certain um, uh, stimuli and have certain characteristics to survive in that environment. So their skin is the full thickness like we would take in the operating room if we were doing an autograph. An amniotic is, it's the one purpose of an amnion is to protect a fetus. So it's a very pristine environment. There's, there's nothing traumatic. Ideally, there's no inflammation. It's got the one goal of just getting that baby to nine months for delivery. So a very unique perspective environment, not a chronic wound environment necessarily. And then if you start looking at the xenographs, um, other types of um, uh, graphs, you know, they all from a teleological standpoint come from a different section that had different implications. The one graph I will call out is um, the, the ovine foregut because stuff coming from the intestines, and of course we got the cyst technology, the substrate intestinal submucosa from pigs, and the regenerative restorative capacity obviously within the lumen of the stomach or the intestine is really critical because it has to have good turnover, good reconstruction to be able to maintain uh, efficacy, because if you get a hole in your stomach, you're not going to do well. You get a hole in your intestines, you're not going to do well. So I think there's some really interesting things about when you're talking about from the, uh, the gastric lumen or the intestinal lumen. So TheraSkin, again, when you look at it, fresh human skin versus TheraSkin, from a, from a standpoint of looking at it underneath a microscope, it's got identical characteristics, but we would expect that. So here's the board questions, right, when you take your test. Uh, imbibition, inosculation, revascularization. So imbibition is what's happening in kind of that first 24 hours. That's where the graft is starting to have um, the initial um, kind of handshake to develop the advance on glycocalyx and where you get the microvascularization to start. Inosculation, inosculation is when in that kind of 48, 72 hours where you're really starting to st start to see robust uh, revascularization. And then you've got the standard where you're starting to actually see angiogenesis and you can see it with the naked eye. So Adam Landsman, this is uh, from his paper that he published, I think just earlier this year. And this image has actually been around for a while, but he used it in the, uh, the wounds paper that came out in May of this year. And this is just to look at near infrared spectro uh, spectroscopy. So you're looking at oxy oxygenation, deoxygenation ratios to look at perfusion. And this is just a nice image that shows after application of the TheraSkin and going through revascularization, you're clearly getting ingrowth into the TheraSkin that is what you need for support. Now, the thing I would tell you is that obviously all the other principles we talked about were applied where you had good wound bed prep before you're sticking on the TheraSkin. And the other thing is on the plantar surface of the foot, what are you gonna do to protect this foot once you put this on? So for our wound clinic, standard of care remains total contact casting. Um, I think that's still, you know, obviously there's not great use across all wound clinics, but total contact casting, still the standard of care. And then um, we, I use a lot of negative pressure wound therapy. I put on both my split thickened skin grafts as well as my thera skin, skin grafts. And I really think that does a lot in terms of helping to maximize again, micro deformation and maximize revascularization. So when we look at the revascularization, and is this a real phenomenon? Uh, Gertner did a wonderful study that was published earlier, I think it was late last year, that looked at, and now this is a, a murine model, so it's not a human model, but they, they broke this down to look at a sham versus a decellularized versus the cryopreserved grafts. And what it showed was that in the acellular, so this is the ADM, the acellular doesn't have the same robust angiogenesis that you're going to see in a cryopreserved human skin allograft, which is the TheraSkin. And then when you look at the sham, um, where they didn't do any implant of a graft, um, that was the control, of course. So ultimately, there's more robust angiogenesis, which I think makes sense when you're looking at the, the, the cellular component in there versus being a decellularized uh, component. So the, the takeaways from this, and what I would encourage you to do is talk to Katie and get the actual PDF. I think uh, reading just the marketing stuff, I, I get the PDF because it's really a interesting um, study that was done to show how TheraSkin as a cryopreserved graph actually has significant impact. So 
one of the concerns always is if we're taking someone else's human skin and sticking it inside on, on another body, is there a concern about rejection? So here's where the immune response is not noted and you don't get this significant inflammatory change, which could compromise a graft. Theraskin also, as we talked about, promotes angiogenesis. You see the significant uh, type one collagen production and the normal restoration of collagen architecture, which is important, I think, also for decreasing ultimately the recidivism rates that Gertner talks about that we see also in the two next studies we're gonna talk about. So Adrian Barbel is down, he was at Johns Hopkins, he's currently down at um, Nashville, general surgeon. But this, this is a guy that has spent a lot of time in wound care. In fact, um, I, I was just reading about him earlier uh, uh, this week. He was awarded by the Wound Healing Society of America, a lifetime award for his significant contributions to uh, wound care. So this was just published late last year. This is Heologics data mining, looking at comparing cohorts. Now this specific study looked primarily at diabetic foot wounds. Get the PDF, read the details, but ultimately it was showing better closure rates with air skin compared to standard of care. I think you really got to dig into standard of care because when you look at this many sites of, I think it was like 470 different sites, they're clearly, ide ideally within Heologic should be standardization of um, care. Statistically significant decrease in recidivism. And I think this is a really important point because once a patient's wound is healed, one of the biggest frustrations for the patient and for us both is when the wound's back, certainly by three months, certainly by six months, certainly by 12 months. Obviously, Decreasing recidivism is more than just the TheraSkin. It's how are you offloading? How are you doing uh, treating your A1C? Are you getting off the smokes, et cetera? So all those things are going to speak very strongly ultimately to decrease recidivism rates. So the, the key takeaway here was after comparing 1,500 patients with TheraSkin versus standard of care, diabetic wounds treated with TheraSkin had a higher chance of healing and then staying healed. And the other nice thing about the study is if you look at most wound care studies, 80, I think the number was, the exact number was 81.3%. 81.3% 81 of previous wound care studies, all comers, they exclude the standard issues that we all deal with in our wound clinics on a daily basis. They're selective in their criteria. They, they exclude a lot of stuff that we deal with. So this is really an all comers study that looks at real world, what we're all dealing. So I think the comparison to our population is very real. Then Gertner study using the same database, but instead of just looking at DFUs, includes VLUs, pressure ulcers, radiation, surgery wounds, trauma. So of course the diabetic and the venous were the most <laughs> representative, but the, the radiation component is, is not insignificant. And this is a very tough group of patients to deal with. I'll show you one of my personal cases I dealt with. So this again, comparing to standard of care, and looking at uh, cohorts and a matched uh, 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 ability so that you're comparing apples and apples in terms of outcomes. So again, they saw better closure rates similar to the Barbola study, lower recidivism rate, less amputation. So 2.75, again, the numbers were low, obviously, in the, the pure amputation rates. And then um, the number of applications was between about two and three applications of their skin, depending on uh, the wound type. This is a super busy, complex slide. It's just, again, to say the power of the data that's been published in peer-reviewed literature to show the benefit of cryopreserved human skin allograft versus other types of management. And since this slide uh, came together, I just reviewed uh, three more studies that have been uh, published just this year in 2020. So Katie can get you all those PDFs to look at that. There's also a 2016 study that's not on this that um, I think Michael Flood published um, I think it was about 15, 16 patients using TheraSkin on exposed uh, structures like tendons and bone where we have the most difficulty getting those things taken care of. Okay, quick few case studies and then we can uh, chat and see if there's any questions. So this was a gentleman that had a really significant hematoma. He was on an anticoagulant after a uh, pulmonary embolus. I'm just trying to back up here. I may not be able to. Here we go. So this, this guy had been sitting in the hospital actually for five days before I saw him. He had seen plastic surgery who said, you know, I think we should just wrap this with an ACE bandage and it's going to get better. Orthopedic surgery didn't want to touch it. And one of my general surgery colleagues saw it and said, you know, could you come and take a look at this with me and, and help me out with what we should do? So took the patient down to the operating room, just made a straight incision across where the hematoma was. There was about two, three units of hematoma in there liquefied. If you think about trying to debris this effectively, if you, there's, there's a water jet option, obviously, that's on. You could use Pulsivac. 
The, the difference with all those, you're counting on water pressure to get rid of a, a really grime layer on the inside of this chronic cavity. So the, the beautiful thing about Sonic One was I can get in there, use it on the entire cavity. I, and it, I think it shows again, getting into um, uh, tunneling, getting into undermining. And I'll show you the video here. So I'm running Prontosan through it. Um, I'll rinse it out with hydrogen peroxide too because hydrogen peroxide is great for lysing red blood cells. And I ran about two uh, bottles of full Prontosan through this to get rid of all of uh, the inside. So this is where, again, wound bed prep is so critical. And, um, and so here he is three weeks post-op. So what I, we started him initially on was Veriflow with uh, hypochlorous acid running through it. We do the cleansing mode of two hours, 20 minute instill or dwell time. And then the other big thing is we use a lot of this edema wear. So in the seven week post-op, you can see that fuzzy whale uh, dermal, it's only eight millimeters of a compression, but uh, we use this on probably 80% of our patients. So with all Veriflows, with all negative pressure wound, wound therapy, I'm using edema wear as well. Again, to decrease interstitial edema because this maximizes dermal lymphatic drainage. So that then gets us the microvascular reperfusion, gets us really good wound healing. And then he was, uh, he, at seven weeks, this would call this completely closed, but there was no cavity. And all it was, was that strip that we then had to get finished on the epithelialization. So he went from that to this at seven weeks. Here's so, a- um, Insert the beer flow? Was it internal? Uh, say it one more time. Did you insert the beer flow? Was it internal? Yeah, we stuck the, the sponge into that cavity. And then, uh, you know, that was a pretty big cavity. So I think the, the installation volume had to be 70 cc's per cycle in that particular case. Again, we're using hypochlorous acid. Uh, I know the 2019 Kim Attinger, the Dr. Kim, the Dr. Attinger uh, wound installation guidelines are still on saline, but we're using hypochlorous on everybody. Uh, and that, I think, again, I think by lowering that wound page, it's really helping us accelerate. Here's using the curette. Uh, this was a traumatic ulceration from uh, this woman's uh, horse stepped on her. She ended up with a huge hematoma. This was actually right at the start of the pandemic in March. And uh, we went on to uh, ultimately then uh, skin graft her. Here's a gentleman who, and you see the little uh, Pluragel. We use a lot of Pluragel because of the Paloxomer 188, which again, helps with micro uh, circulatory restoration. And uh, this guy had a melanoma, a recurrent melanoma. He had gone through three different rounds of radiation therapy, ended up with that whole Theraskin piece there exposed uh, calvarium. So I actually called Michael Flood before I took this guy to the operating room, just because of his experience from that 2016 paper. And we used um, a bone drill in the operating room. Then we used on top of that uh, Sonic One. And then we went to the uh, application of the Theraskin and then put negative pressure wound therapy on top of that. So he was just in to see me last week. This has been about a six month transition. He is now down to two little spots that have maybe one by one millimeter bone exposed. I've given him a total of now three applications of uh, Theraskin. One was in the operating room, ended up the next two were in the clinic. So another really nice, uh, uh, good application. This young gal, multiple sclerosis, non-ambulatory, mid 40s, significant interstitial edema. She's got significant sarcopenia, muscle atrophy, and uh, a kind hearted person thought, well, let's help her by getting rid of that edema, wrapped her in ACE bandages. So an elastic instead of inelastic, so high resting pressure and almost a tourniquet effect. And then came back to check on her three days later, kind of like you would do with inelastic. And she had these horrible ischemic pressure ulcers. So this was an iatrogenic uh, injury. And you can see the, uh, the right heel's got the significant ulceration, the left. Um, so we took her to the operating room, ended up using a, a, a blade, to obviously, to get rid of all that really thick eschar, got down to tendon, and then did ultrasonic debridement. And then in this particular case, we went right away to a Theraskin uh, application because of the exposed structure. She was not down to bone, down to, um, um, she was not down to bone on the, on the right heel, but pretty close. So we wanted to get her and then going on stuff right away. And then we, this is adaptic. I've actually transitioned to, to using Acticote 
on almost everybody as the interface layer between the thera skin and the negative pressure wound therapy. And ultimately, um, she went on over the course uh, of, a, it was about three months to get her completely healed. Again, see the lines in the skin. That line is from the edema where we're using to reduce interstitial edema. And you can see where the transition point is on the end of her left foot. She's obviously had her left great toe amputated. That was a previous traumatic event. But you can see the significant reduction in interstitial edema. Again, that's what's enhancing. Now, when you look at the picture of the right heel, you can see where the thera skin is. One of the things we've noticed, it can act like a ghost after time. So if you see a plateau in wound healing, that's the time to apply the next piece of thera skin if that's your chosen entity to make the next step. But obviously the other critical thing in her is offloading. So we got her into rook boots, which are the vascular boots, which are insulated offloading to help protect her feet uh, also. So we're coming down to the last couple of slides here. Indications we've talked about, really there, there is not a contraindication to utilization. You gotta be careful, obviously, if you're gonna get somewhere um, on the front of the face. And given that I'm a general surgeon, I'm not doing anything on the face. Uh, head to toe, overexposed bone, tendon, joint capsules, muscle. There, there's uh, every structure so far I've utilized on this and it's uh, been with great outcomes. So. We talked about the decrease uh, log five reduction. So getting below that 10 to the fifth critical uh, forming units, um, helping to reduce blood loss, reducing time and cost of care along the longitudinal aspect of treatment spectrum. Again, in the operating room, there's gonna be a bucket where you gotta have it sit down and have a conversation. It's incredibly worth it across the spectrum of cares. And um, again, I'm using Sonic one, two wound bed prep, everything I'm doing uh, at this point. Um, the evidence is there, peer-reviewed literature to support utilization of TheraSkin and Sonic One. There was a good uh, paper that was published looking at 22.5 versus higher piezoelectric effects. Clearly the 22.5 is kind of the sweet spot for application to maximize debridement and not injure tissues. Um, TheraSkin has clearly been shown to safe uh, with utilization of the American Association of Tissue Banks. And the other thing I really like is there's such great size options. So unlike having a Petri dish where I'm stuck with one size because I don't like wasting product, I can specifically size it to that point. In fact, we had a woman in uh, today that I'm gonna use the, it's basically the dot. Uh, I think it's, it's even smaller than the six centimeter squared that we're gonna use on her. So look at the size of the wound. And the only reason I'm using her is we've already gone through the month of roll in and she's, She's not responding like a five-year chronic wound. So we will do everything usually up front, wound bed prep, look at where we're at on that healing plateau in the first month of in, um, induction through treatments in the wound clinic. And if they're, not, if they're not plateauing. So as you all know the data, if there's not a 50% reduction in wound within the first four weeks, the chance that wound's gonna go on to heal is incredibly low. If there's a greater than 50% uh, reduction in the first uh, month, then there's at least a 53 to 55% chance that that wound's gonna go on to heal within three months. So that first month is really important. Uh, quote by Leonardo da Vinci, and you guys have all seen this before. He's, he's had some great, great quotes about uh, human skin as well as the foot. That's gonna end the slides. Is uh, Be happy to uh, host any questions, any, if anything, any ins or any other insights you wanna share about utilization of um, products you have or these products.